In this session, we shall discuss interventions of organizational development. Just as a doctor diagnoses the problems of his patients and then he prescribes a line of treatment, similarly after a, any organization has undergone an organizational development program, it has to be followed by some intervention programs. There are many intervention programs that are tailor-made for the situation. Some of the intervention programs are survey feedback, process consultation, management by objectives, sensitivity training, team building and so on and so forth. Today, in our session, we shall have a look at four such intervention programs. Process consultation, survey feedback, sensitivity training and management by objectives. So first, let's begin with process consultation. Process consultation is a process in which an organization would hire the services of an external agent. This external agent is a consultant who would work with individuals or group of individuals in the organization to help them look into the processes of the organization, try to find problems which stem from them and arrive at solutions. Process consultation normally goes with intervention techniques like sensitivity training which facilitates improvement, survey feedback which entails self-reflection, team building that helps the team in socializing and others. Let us look at a definition of process consultation given by Shine. Shine has defined process consultation as the set of activities on the part of the consultant which help the client to perceive, understand and act upon the process events which occur in the client's environment. So the question that comes to our minds is what are the processes for which we shall hire the services of an external consultant to help us solve the problems in the institution. So let us have a look at the processes that one can expect in any organization. The areas that are focused in process consultation are communication, functional roles of members, group problem solving and decision making, group norms and growth, leadership and authority, intergroup cooperation and competition. Let us look at the first process that has been enlisted and that is communication. In any organization, communication flows to and fro for all the routine activities. You have communication flowing from the authority to the subordinates, among the subordinates and from the subordinate to the authority. So for process consultation, we would be looking at what are the barriers and snags in these communications and what prevents a free flow of communication in the organization. The next area that would come under process consultation would be functional role of members. Every member in an organization has a specific role to play. Depending on their job profile and job description, they have to follow certain norms, criteria and duties to accomplish their role. The next process we would like to look at is group problem solving and decision making. In many organizations, there are groups that work together as teams. Another process in an organization is group norms and growth. Once again, in an organization, there are a lot of norms that regulate the interactions between groups and the structure by how they are related. How growth takes place, how promotions, etc. 
would be tackled and many a times these processes can be barriers in any organization's climate. There could be conflicts and there could be other problems arising in these processes. Let us look at another area that comes under process consultation and that is leadership and authority. Leadership of any organization is the backbone to the organization and the kind of leadership styles that are adopted by the heads, managers of any organization can have far-reaching effects on the climate of the organization and the effectiveness as a result. And so also how authority is exercised. So many a times these processes have to be looked into very deeply and diagnosed for problems. And finally, let us have a look at the process of intergroup cooperation and competition. Depending on the organization's climate and the leadership styles, you may have a competitive atmosphere or you may have a lot of collaborative activities taking place in an organization. So one needs to look at these processes once again. There could be barriers in group collaborative activities, problems of communication among the members, conflicts and at times the competition that is taking place in the organization can become very unhealthy and detrimental to the organizational growth and hence one also needs to look into these processes and find solutions to the problems. Having spoken about the processes that go under process consultation, let us now look at what are the assumptions that are made during the process of process consultation. The first assumption is that managers need help to diagnose what is wrong in the organization. Even though the manager is an internal member of any organization, many a times he may be reflecting his own biases and prejudices and lack clarity in able to diagnose a problem that occurs in the organization. The second assumption is that even though managers have the desire, they do not know how to help improve the organizational effectiveness. So they do require some expert advice in order to work in the correct direction. Our third assumption is that managers can be effective if they learn to diagnose strengths and weaknesses. If they are assisted in this process, they would be better equipped as managers. The next assumption that we make is that the consultant and the manager have to work in harmony. The consultant is an external agent and does not know everything about the organization, whereas the manager is an insider of the organization and would be able to provide a very good insight to the external agent. Hence, they both need to work in harmony. And the final assumption is that the manager needs to see the problems and express the desirable state of affairs to the external consultant. And the external consultant needs to work on these problems and suggest the necessary remedial measures for it. The procedure of the process consultation is presented in the form of a model which goes like this. First we have the initial contact, later we define relationship, then selection of a method, collection of data and diagnosis, having the intervention program and reducing involvement and termination of the consultant. So let us have a look at the very first step and that is initial contact. As we have said, the consultant is an external agent 
there is a meeting that takes place between the consultant and the manager. In the next step, relationships are defined. What exactly would be the relationship between and the processes and tasks between the consultant and the manager are decided upon. Since this is a very professional kind of a relationship that takes place in a formal setting, everything has to be meticulously planned. In the third step, selection of a method takes place. Both the consultant and the manager together decide on a method of collecting data as data has to be gathered from every nook and corner of the organization, from all its processes and all the people who are involved in these processes. So at this stage, what would be the methods for gathering the data is decided upon. Once the method has been selected and the tools have been decided, the data is gathered from all the stakeholders, from all the resources. On the basis of the data that is gathered, a thorough analysis takes place and the underlying problems are tried to be located. These underlying problems need the diagnosis. That is the crux of the process consultation. The consultant and the manager together decide the intervention programs that now need to be taken to address the problem that has been diagnosed. And these intervention programs could be any of the programs like a sensitivity training program, team building, survey feedback, etc. The process consultation also follows a time frame and once the problem has been diagnosed and the intervention programs have been decided, there is time for the contact between the consultant and the manager to end. So, in the last step, it is decided whether it is time for this contract to be terminated and can the manager now have the autonomy of carrying on without the help of the external agent. Let us now look at another intervention program called the survey feedback. In organizations, it is a normal practice to give feedback about events, processes in an informal manner. The manager with his subordinates and the subordinates among themselves would be interacting and giving a feedback. But when the same feedback of the entire organization is taken in a formal setting, it takes the form of survey feedback and it is used to address and solve problems which are bothering any organization. The credit of using survey feedback as an intervention tool goes to man and his associates. So what exactly is this survey feedback? The survey feedback is a formal system in which feedback is gathered from all the stakeholders of an organization through very structured questionnaires where this information that is gathered is then analyzed and underlying problems are brought to the fore to solve and address them. And this would also require the assistance of an external agent or an expert. The primary objectives of survey feedback are to help the organization diagnose its problems and find action plans to address these problems, to help group members improve their interpersonal relationships through group discussion and problem solving. The steps in survey feedback are data collection, feedback of information, developing action plans based on feedback and follow-up. The first step in survey feedback is data collection. For data collection, normally an organization would hire the service 
of a consultant firm. A structured questionnaire would be used by the firm to gather data and the questionnaire would cover areas like support and facilitation provided by the leader, peer interactions, organizational climate, decision-making strategies, measures of control within the organization, coordination between different departments, job satisfaction and issues around it, salary issues, etc. The questionnaire may be administered either by the expert or by people within the organization. After the questionnaires have been filled in by the people, they are classified and the data is analyzed to arrive at some conclusions. The purpose of this entire exercise is to give a feedback to the concerned people in the organization to improve effectiveness. So after the data has been gathered and analyzed, it has to be, the results have to be presented in the form of a feedback to the organization. This feedback can be given either in the oral or in a written form. When it is given in the oral form, it can be in the form of group discussions and problem solving techniques may be employed. On the other hand, if it is to be given in the written form, a written summary is provided. Care has to be taken that the feedback is given in a very sensitive manner. It should be constructive, not critical. It helps the institution to identify its strengths and weaknesses, not uh, with the intention of criticizing, downsizing, and it should definitely help in improvement without hurting anybody's sentiments. The success of the survey feedback would depend upon the last step and that is follow-up. In this step, the organization has to come up with some follow-up program for the problems that have been identified. Either the workers in the organization would be suggested to come up with their own workable solution plans or then certain intervention programs can be organized for the benefit of all. And these intervention programs could once again be programs like team building, etc. Let's move on to our next intervention program for organizational development and this is the sensitivity training. Let us take the example of a typical Indian organization. One would find in an Indian organization people belonging to different faiths, speaking different languages and if it is an inclusive organization there would be differently abled people too. In our formal and informal interactions with one another we many a times unintentionally may make statements that would hurt the sentiments of our fellow workers and definitely such statements and disturbances can cause tensions in the interpersonal relations in an organization that would impact the climate of any organization. Today the world is a global village and multicultural settings is a common phenomenon everywhere. So there is a need for making people culturally more responsive and sensitive to the need of others. So what exactly is this sensitivity training program? The sensitivity training program is an emotional training that helps individuals examine their own intrinsic judgments and prejudices and help them to be more sensitive to the needs of others. The founder of the sensitivity training program is generally seen as the psychologist Kurt Lewin who had conducted a series of change experiments for the Connecticut State Interracial Commission in 1946. Let us have a look at how the sensitivity training program takes place. 
it normally takes place in three steps and these three steps are unfreezing the old values, development of new values and refreezing of the new values. Let us examine the first step of the sensitivity training program that is unfreezing the old values. The personnel of an organization or the trainees of a program in the first step are put together in a situation where the group is very unstructured without any agenda or objective and as a result they start looking out for the trainer for his guidance. The trainer on the other hand refuses to provide any guidance or take up leadership. The trainees are now forced to take charge of the situation and so they motivate themselves to resolve this uncertainty in the group. They start assuming different roles. Some of them try to assume the role of a leader and some of them dislike this stand. And very soon perhaps chaos may prevail. Then they start examining their feelings and reactions. The purpose of the entire exercise is to make the trainees aware of the inadequacy of the old values and to question themselves about their reactions and values. The second step in the sensitivity training program is development of new values. Now in this step, the trainees with the trainer's support start examining their interpersonal behavior and also give each other feedback on the same. On the basis of the feedback, the trainees are now motivated to experiment with new behavior values. Thus in this step, a change takes place in the old values with development of new values. The next step of the sensitivity training program is refreezing the new ones. In this step, there is a need to fix the new values learned by the group. The more opportunities that are provided to the learners, the better is the chance of the values being fixed and biases and prejudices being diluted. Let us now look at our fourth intervention for organizational development and that is management by objectives. Management by objectives is a philosophy and an approach and it has been championed by the management guru Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker in his book The Practice of Management outlined a number of priorities for the manager and on the topmost list of these priorities was a manager must manage by objectives. So what is management by objectives? To put it in very simple terms, normally in an organization, people at the higher levels of management are responsible for designing goals and objectives. And then these objectives and goals filter down to the lower rungs in the hierarchy. Thus, management by objectives says that the goals and objectives should not be imposed from above, but instead the employees should be involved in charting out their own goals and objectives, perhaps their personal goals and objectives and aligning them with the organizational goals and then trying to achieve them within a time frame. In this manner, the employees are more accountable and more acceptable to the goals and objectives of the organization. To get a better insight into the meaning of management by objectives, let us look at two definitions of management by objectives. According to Koons and Verick, management by objectives is a comprehensive managerial system that integrates many key managerial activities in a systematic manner and that is consciously directed toward the effective and efficient achievement of organizational and individual objectives. According to George Odeon, student of Peter Drucker, who took the idea further 
Management by objectives is a process whereby superior and subordinate managers of an organization jointly define its common goals, define each individual's major areas of responsibility in terms of results expected of him, and use these measures as guides for operating the unit and assessing the contribution of each of its members. Thus, management by objectives is is the setting of goals for the employees so that they clearly know what is expected of them at the workplace. It clearly defines roles and responsibilities of the employees so that they can chalk out their future plans and programs based on these goals and objectives. It guides the employees to deliver to the best of their ability and also to achieve the goals in the stipulated time frame and above all it shifts the focus from exercising control to assuming control of oneself. Let us now have a look at the process of management by objectives. For this let us look at the given diagram. The process of MBO has been broken into the following steps. It begins with defining organizational goals. The next step is defining employees objectives. The third step is continuous monitoring performance and progress. The fourth is performance evaluation. The fifth step we have providing feedback and the last step is performance appraisal. But as you can see the process is cyclic which means it is a continuous process and an ongoing process. Let us look in detail at each step. The first step is defining organizational goals. Goals of any organization are very important for its existence and these goals can be designed by the managers at the topmost level and managers of various departments getting together. Thus the preliminary goals are designed by the managers at the topmost level. In the next step of defining employee goals, the managers would now sit with their employees and engage in a conversation and help them design their own personal goals. These goals according to Peter Drucker have to be the SMART goals specific, measurable, actionable, reasonable and time bound. The manager helps the employee to look at all the resources that are available, define a time frame within which the reasonable goals that have been designed can be achieved. The next step is the continuous monitoring of the performance and progress. The manager would very closely examine and monitor the progress of his employees. There would be some control measures that have been predetermined and he would constantly motivate as well as check whether the employee is close to the objectives that he has slated out. The next step is performance evaluation. So continuously the manager would also keep evaluating giving value judgments on the performance of the employee. After all these steps have been done, the next step would be providing a feedback. It is time for the manager to meet his employees and personally give them a feedback, motivating, appreciating for the achievements as well as asking them to buck up where they lack. In the last step, a performance appraisal takes place. So again, there is a personal meeting between the manager and the employee where a stock is taken of the progress, how close the employee was able to come to the goals that he had slated out, what were the weaknesses, what were the barriers and he would also in turn adequately compensate or reward the employees for achieving the objectives. 
A shining example of the success of management by objectives is when Hewlett Packard, the computer company, declared MBO the HP way. In fact, at Hewlett Packard, at every level, every manager designs his own objectives and goals, integrates them with the managers of the other departments and then with the company as a whole. In fact, Bill Packard, one of the founder members of Hewlett Packard has said, no operating policy has contributed more to HP success than MBO. So how does management by objectives contribute to the success of an organization? The human resource is the hub of any organization, the backbone. And when you motivate the human resource, the best of results can be achieved. Management by objectives makes the employees feel valued. When they are taken into consideration in designing the objectives of the institution, they get motivated, enthused and they want to give their best. This is the best solution for apathy, lack of enthusiasm and low morale. And with self-motivated employees, any organization can scale soaring heights. We have had a look at four interventions for organizational development. Each has its unique place and has some way or the other to contribute in the development and evolution of an organization or in bringing about a change in the attitudes of people. Thank you.